afternoon to all the participants. We are here today to uh, talk about thesis writing webinar. We will be starting the webinar shortly. However, you, uh, I request all the participants to relax and sit back. We are waiting for more participants to join. So in a couple of more minutes, we will start the webinar on thesis writing. So I hope that the participants have enjoyed our previous webinars and could get a lot of takeaways on really many of the aspects which we have been covering. So today we are going to talk more about thesis writing, how it could be done, what are the various aspects that have to be covered and how they need to be addressed. So we shall talk about this and then we will work it out on the various aspects. So we will be starting the seminar webinar shortly. A warm good afternoon to all the participants. So there is a separate question answer session that we have at the end of the webinar. So the participants do not have to really worry about the question answers. We will be addressing them. Now, this webinar is being conducted by research graduate. So let us try to, uh, you know, understand about what we do and who are we. So before I start, uh, let me wish all the participants a happy Teacher's Day. So today is one such nice occasion where in which sharing knowledge will be very, you know, useful and fruitful. So I wish all the participants a happy Teacher's Day. And having said that, let us now proceed ahead and try to, uh, you know, understand what we do and how we work with the various aspects. Research graduate is the best PhD and master's consulting company. We are here to help various research scholars on their research work. We can help the researchers, both international as well as national researchers, on a variety of aspects and topics, which include topic selection, proposal writing, review paper writing, research paper writing, thesis writing, master's dissertation, statistical analysis, and editing, proofreading, and formatting. So, uh, whatever may be the topic that you have, don't uh, you don't have to really worry about that. You can always come to us and request a query and we will try to, you know, adjust to it and come back with the bus, uh, uh, best possible option. So we can, it could be you just want to have the topics written for you. We can do that for you. If in case you have already returned the paper or you have written any other ones. So you can, you know what, uh, you can write to us. If it is just <clears throat> editing or proofreading, we also can do that for you. If you want us to write the, you know, what do you call, if you want us to write the complete thesis or complete paper or parts of thesis or parts of paper, we can do it. So you, I let me tell, tell to all the participants that don't worry about what we can write or in what ways we can help you. You just drop in your query and once you drop in your query, then we will be uh, helpful to you in many other ways. So you first give us the query, we'll go through it, and then we will try to tell you what is the best possible thing we can do for you. So please remember that, uh, you know, we are here to help you because the uh, anything, either it's a thesis writing or any other aspects of research paper or review article writing, it is not easy. And, I, and we find that many of them have confusions associated with it. We are here to clear your confusions and we are here to help you out in various aspects. So having said that, I welcome all the participants again to this webinar on thesis writing. A happy Teacher's Day to all of you. You can contact us at the following email ID, info at researchgraduate.com or you can WhatsApp us at the phone number provided on the slide or just go to our website researchgraduate.com and it could be helpful. So uh, 
this webinar first we'll focus on the webinar and once we are done there is a live question answer session at the end of it so you can have uh, what you call you can always have the your question answers being done if in case if they have not been answered please drop in an email to us we will reply to your queries having said that now let's get started with the webinar on thesis writing so let's start with it conducted by research graduate now before i start with the webinar here are the contents which i will be covering it this time in thesis writing i'm covering it in a slightly different manner we just have a first a preliminary introduction on what is thesis and why do you have to write thesis why is it required for then we talk about the various thesis contents what are the various ones that you have? Introduction, review of literature, research methodology, results, summary, conclusion, and recommendations. So we just talk about this in a bit. Then we connect them with, because having introduced to those, we talk about how to write those, how to write each of them, how to write the abstract, introduction, review of literature, research methodology, results, discussion, conclusion, and references. We'll be covering these aspects initially. Then we come to writing tips. Now, this is something which I have focused on this time because many a times participants know that they can write, but you know, they are not aware of some of the writing tips. So I thought this time I would include this out, such as a vagueness, being accurate, not using irrelevant statements and a bit of grammar. Then what are the important tips for writing the thesis? How do you write a good thesis? The various aspects that are important to be considered before submitting the thesis. And once you submit your thesis and you get back with reviewers comments, how do you go ahead with all of the reviewers comments? So we will be talking of all of this in detail. So please don't worry about your questions. We'll definitively answer them. So you sit back, relax, and try to understand whatever we are trying to you know, explain here. So let us start first with introduction to thesis. Now, what exactly is thesis? A thesis is a scientific argument. For whatever work you have done, you are presenting an argument. You are making a case and you are presenting it. So it is nothing but a summary of your observations pertaining to a specific field. It's your insight which you are presenting in the form of an argument. It is one of the core essentialities in any research study. If you are done with it and if you have done it already, then it is essential that you need to put forth your thoughts in the form of thesis. Thesis identifies two major aspects. One, the various ideas which are already existing based on which you have started your work. Two, what are the ideas that you have got out from your work and that you have proved? So thesis is a bridging connection between what is already present to what is extension that you have done. So it connects the past with the present very beautifully and thus helps you to understand uh, and give an idea to the reader, reader as what you have done and how you have done it. So having said that, um, so this is what is basically thesis about. Now, why we have to write thesis? That's an interesting question. A thesis is a contribution to the field. You are contributing to the academic community by writing thesis. So uh, it is very important in such a way uh, that you know you put forth your scientific contribution. In the process of writing thesis, you learn two things how to do research and how to write. So if you want to write the thesis, you should already have the research with you. If you only have the research, you can write the thesis, otherwise you can't write it. So it's an interconnection. First you learn how to do the research, then you learn how to write based on the research that you have done. Then what are the advantages of writing the thesis and in what way it helps you? One, it helps you to complete your degree, whether it's master's, bachelor's, or PhD degree. Then once you have a very good sound thesis, which has been pub uh, published, you can get them published in the form of research articles and research papers in academic journals. And having a thesis gives you a degree. 
if you are a PhD student and it goes further along that it will help you for laying a foundation for better and future uh, prospectives. So thus thesis in that, in that way is very, very helpful for you and then will be an outstanding contribution in the field. So writing a thesis does signifies a lot. So then the thesis writing process is a very long procedure. First, even before you think of writing the thesis, you should work for the thesis, which includes first working on the thesis proposal. You have ideas which you crystallize them and present in the form of a proposal that you want to do this. Then you set it, send it to the committee and you defend in the front of committee that you want to do it. Then the committee approves it. Usually an year or two of the PhD goes here. Then you collect the data. Then after collecting the data, you analyze the data, you write the thesis and prepare for defense. This whole process is split out into years. This will take around two years. This whole process needs three to four years. An average thesis in India or US requires around six to seven years. However, European thesis are much, much smaller, requiring only three to four years. So there the time span and timeline will be constrained definitively off. So giving you such a broad idea about thesis. Now let us start with the thesis structure. Now, if the participants are aware of, if they have seen any thesis, it has a definitive structure. The structure of the thesis includes the title page. It includes the abstract. Then it includes introduction, materials and methods. Uh, results, discussion, conclusion, acknowledgement and references. It's a very standard format and is universally applicable for any thesis. Now in the thesis structure, the first one is title page. The title page is reflective of so many things. It reflects what you have done, where you have done, under whose guidance you have done. So it will have the title and even the subtitles if applicable author, institution, department, the date at which you have submitted it, who was your research mentor and in which institution you have done with your address for contact. A sample of which has been put forth here, as you can see, it's the impact of temperature, changes on aircraft dynamics, a finite element study, that's the title of the thesis. It says by the author's name, James Bond, a dissertation submitted to Department of Aeronautical Engineering, University of London. That gives you the details where you did it. In partial fulfillment for requirements of degree of Master of Science. So it is not for PhD, but this is for Master's degree. Then the year July 2020. And in the bottom, you have supervised by Jane Moneypenny. So you have all the details in the thesis title page. This is a standard format for writing the title page. And that is how you write it. Then having said that we come to abstract so what exactly is abstract now abstract for a thesis abstract for either review or literature uh, research paper they <coughs> all are pretty much the same abstract is a clear and concise statement which tells what work has been done and what has been achieved it is the first substantive description of your work read by an external examiner so always the point to be remembered is when once you write your thesis, your thesis is sent to reviewers for evaluation. And before the whole thesis is sent, the abstract is sent to the reviewers picked up by your supervisor. The reviewers go through the abstract and then they decide if this thesis is worth reviewing or is it not worth reviewing. It is the first description of your work read by an external examiner. It abstract summarizes the whole thesis, but in a short and abridged version. It functions along if you if there is no thesis, abstract alone is a standalone text for highlighting your thesis. It is not just an introduction. It is your soul which is present in the abstract of the work. It must be capable of substituting for whole thesis when there is no sufficient time to talk about your whole thesis. And hence, it is that abstract is very critical and important. 
So one has to be careful the way they write it. We will talk about it in later as how. Based on your abstract is the decision taken by the reviewers to review it or not. Then the next one of the next aspect of thesis is table of contents. Table of contents summarizes the whole thing. If you have figures, you have tables, you have any other, uh, you know, representative elements which are present, all have to be shown. So table of content will have introduction and all others also. So you list all the headings and subheadings with page numbers. You have in you indent your subheadings and it looks something like this. You have list of figures with those many page numbers, list of tables, page numbers, introduction and the subheadings in introduction with the page numbers, methods, results, discussions in the same way, conclusions, recommendations, acknowledgements, references and appendices all with page numbers. The table of contents is prepared at the end when the thesis has been proofread and you are willing to submit it. Because once page numbers are written in the table of contents, they can't be changed and there can be no errors here. If you have errors here, then the thesis will be rejected because of lack of integrity of writing. So having said that, the next comes is list of figures and tables. Now list the page numbers of all the figures. And it's important that when you just mention about the figures, you give a brief caption about the figures. Don't write all the details, but a brief caption. Same holds true for tables also. List <coughs> page numbers of all the tables. The list also should include a short title for each table, but not the whole caption for it. Remember, when you are writing a thesis and submitting it, it should be like a catalog indexing catalog when you try to order something in scientific research you're ordering reagents and others people provide or the reagents are provided as a catalog with all the necessary details now it goes very beautifully drafted with various pages description as what is where and how it is Imagine your thesis also like a catalog in which you are reflecting your whole work. So the presentability of the work should be very cleanly executed. So all these initial pages that you have will make a lot of importance and will signify a lot as such. So it is very essential that you focus on these aspects, though they look smaller aspects, but they have a lot of significance when it comes to overall appearance of the thesis. Now, we then that gets us to introduction. Now, introduction is an important aspect of thesis because introduction explains what has already been done in the field in which you're working. What is that which you are aiming to do? So it's connecting the past with the present and it proposes your research hypothesis as well. So introduction, when you have to write, you should understand the whole thesis. Only then you can write the introduction. So a golden rule of thumb is that you write the introduction only when your entire thesis and remaining chapters are written. So introduction usually is written last because then you know what you have written. So it's easy to write the introduction. Always try to include a hook at the beginning of introduction. A hook here is a statement which is sufficiently interesting and catches the reader's attention. Now, you should explain all the various important aspects related to the scientific problem that you are trying to solve or address. So the introduction is written in paragraphs. The first one or two paragraphs typically go and try to explain what is the existing literature and you come up to the point where what is your idea. Then you have the remaining paragraphs in which you explain your idea as what you want to do. You propose the research hypothesis or the scientific problem that you would do. And please incorporate citations in recommendation in introduction because they form the core basic area for your thesis. Okay, so it should cite those who had the idea or ideas first and should also cite those who have done the most recent and relevant work. So citations become an important aspect. Introduction is not a literature review, so you don't have to write it elaborate, but you write as how it is required. 
Now, this figure beautifully explains in summary as what I'm trying to say here, you have the context. So first one or two paragraphs will have broad questions or issue with your specific question. What is the problem you are trying to address? What is the literature existing you put here? Then you connect it with what is that you want to do. So you explain your position and your thesis statement or hypothesis. Then you come to main points, which is the overview of your argument. So what is the argument that you want to present? In the results, you come back and explain if your argument is met or not. And always when we write the introduction, it is important to remember you not just connect the past, present, you put your hypothesis, but introduction also should give a brief overview of what are the various chapters which are there that are will be presented in the thesis and a brief summary of each of the chapters in few lines. So the ending of the introduction should give an idea of the rest of the whole thesis. What is that which is present and how it is. Then it completes the full introduction section. Then once you write the introduction for the thesis, then you focus on review of literature. Now review of literature is very extensive. We will be covering how to do it, no doubt in this webinar today. A literature review identifies, evaluates and synthesizes the relevant literature existing in the field. There is a term which is aptly used called research gap as it has been proposed here. It's either the unexplored or under-researched area, which is your focus. Live review of literature or literature review, it, it helps you to identify the research gap. It helps you to understand the bridge which exists between your study and what's already published. Now, it does in, in one way, it illuminates how knowledge has evolved over the field. So what are the already existing aspects? A literature review should not include every single source that you have read, but it should be a concise summary of it. Now, when you are writing literature review, most of the times participants think it's just cut, copying, paste from the papers and modifying so that plagiarism is removed. Unfortunately, it's not because you have to put in your critical thinking, your credibility and reliability here and try to explain logically how you have reached the research gap. That is where you have to showcase that as a researcher, you have grown knowledgeable enough that later on you can work on your own and publish more papers and provide more thesis to the scientific community. Now, this is the literature review process and these are the various steps which are associated with it. First, you select a topic. Once you select the topic, you start doing the literature review. Once you start doing, you collect the papers, you write the review. Then you go back and look at the literature again to evaluate whatever you have written. Then you critic the literature, meaning you try to find both the positives and negatives about whatever has been published. Then you develop an argument. This is the six fold strategy for literature review process. All these six steps become important. When you, when you initially write the review, it will be very broad. But by the time you critic it, you try to end polish your review in such a way that it finally comes the way you want it and the way you wish to develop it out. And hence, literature review is like a learning process. Before you even you start doing your thesis, when you are writing the thesis proposal itself, you have to have the literature review in hand because the committee is going to ask you questions on the existing literature. Then they are going to ask you as what you are going to do and how to connect it out. So literature review thus will be done initially itself and later on it comes out to be very useful. Then having said it, let us move on to the next section, which is methods. The methods section looks very boring and monotonous when either writing papers or writing thesis, but it cannot be neglected because that is the core aspects as what, how you have done your logic behind choosing specific approach, either in doing experiments or in collecting data, why you have followed that approach, what is the necessity to follow that approach and how you have followed it comes in your methods section. Now it allows the reader to assess the believability of your results. And if you have returned certain methods, the reader can go back and use those and see if he can replicate the same result. 
then the description of your materials procedure and theory that is what is there in the method section all the calculations techniques procedures equipments and calibration plots all of them will be there in methods if there are any limitations for the study if something couldn't be done all those are expressed in the method section the various softwares used for analyzing the data and the way you have analyzed the data also are written here Methods section has citations, but they are limited. You don't have more than 10 to 15 citations or maximum 20 because you are following somebody else's method. It is compulsory that you have to cite it. If in case you are following your own methods, which you have developed, you have to explain it in detail as how you have done it. Then here is what is a crisp idea of what exactly is the methods section. Research methodology and methods section are identical, but methodology is far more broader and methods are only a part of the methodology. Many a times participants get confused between what is research methodology and methods. So please be careful about that. Methods is a subset of methodology. It's not just like methods alone is not methodology. Methodology will come back later and tell what it is because it is there in next slides. This section includes the selection of research methodology and the reasons for why it has been selected. You should mention the reasons for selecting the method. Also, you should specify the reason for choosing to research that particular subject area of your dissertation. You can also add advantages of using one method over other, meaning you can compare a couple of methods, but you need to have data for comparison and you have to say which method is superior to other methods as such. In that way, it will be useful. Then we come to results section. Now, the results section has actual statements or observations which try to tell what is that which you have found what is that which you have observed it includes the statistics tables and graphs it, in, it indicates information on a range of uh, you know, variations in your results. When you are putting in the results section, it's important that you put in both the, what you call positive as well as negative results. You don't interpret results. That is the most golden rule of thumb is never interpret the results. That is left for discussion section. In If you are using international units, use in the nomenclature of SI units throughout the thesis. Now, results are never written as one paragraph. You have multiple paragraphs with appropriate headings and subheadings. Results are not just paragraphs and text. They also have images, which are nothing but graphs, charts and tables which will explain, which are explained with the corresponding text. Now, whenever you are stating the key results, please try to be clear when you are stating them. For example, there is a significant relationship between X and Y is too broad a statement. But however, if you say X had significant positive relationship with Y, with a linear regression of of being less than 0 0.01 and R square value of 0 0.79, that adds more weightage to your results. So when you're writing the results, it's important that you use such crisp statements and include statistics so that it becomes very useful for the person who is trying to read it rather than making such broad statements, which might not have any sense as such. Then. Next important aspect with the results section is you need to quarantine your results, meaning results absolutely have no interpretations. You just put in and explain the table or chart, whatever is ex whatever is the observation in the table of ch or the chart, the same thing is what you put forth and explain in the result. The writer should make it crystal clear to the reader which statements are observations and which are interpretations. And if it is required that you have interpret something, that should not be more than one line or two lines because you are going to discuss it detail in discussion section. Phrases such as we infer that help in making the statements clear in the results section. And most importantly to all participants, there is nothing like a short result and a long result. A result is a result. If the results are short also, it doesn't matter. It is the weightage is given to the result and not to the length of the result, whether how many results you have in the section and how many you don't have. So don't worry if results seem short, just go ahead, you use them 
and explain them very briefly. Then this is the results section. Results section presents your findings. You use tables, figures and equations as appropriate. Textual commentary is provided for the tables, figures and equations in the appropriate manner. You provide explanation for whatever is required only. And always when you start writing the thesis, write the results section first because it's the easiest to write. You have results with you, you have analyzed the data, so you just have to put it. So results is written first, following which you can, you know, start with the discussion, then conclusion, and then you can come to others. Ideally, yes, or you can write the method section first following by results, any of them. But these two are the easiest because methods are from relevant papers and results are from your observations as such. So uh, in that way, it is very useful and it becomes, you know, very good to understand and, you know, to work out as such. So having said that, now let us proceed to the discussion. So what exactly is discussion in the thesis? A discussion is interpretation of your results. You are summarizing the most important results, whatever you have. The discussion section is like a brief assay, which explains various questions here. Like first A, what are the major patterns in the observation? So are you finding any major patterns in your observation? If you are finding patterns, then you can go ahead and mention them. If you are not finding, you have to justify for it. Now, if they are the trends that are being observed, are the trends common across the results or the trends different across the results? What, are, what is expected from the results? Is it a generalization or is it a pattern that you are expecting? Now, if you are expecting a pattern, is the pattern, uh, would you call, uh, is the pattern matching with already the pattern that is there or is it different? If it is different, why is it different? And if it is same, then it is just easy. Is there an agreement or disagreement with the previous work? All these various aspects come in discussion. So you have to rope in literature when you are explaining the discussion. As it is said here, interpret results in terms of the background laid out in introduction. So you have already used the introduction and you have given the hypothesis. So many of the papers in introduction come even in discussion. So what is the original research question that is there in your introduction? So are we answering that? Is that what you have to discuss in discussion? Now, what is the implication of the present results? Is it useful for the society? Is it useful for individual or it has no much of significance other than for your work? And if multiple hypotheses have been proposed, do you have sufficient data? Uh, what do you call them? Um, do you have sufficient data to comply with all the hypothesis proposed or does it support any of the hypothesis? Now that has to be discussed in detail in discussion. What are the things we know or understand from this study and what are the things that you will not understand from this study? So these are the aspects which are clearly covered here and which are mentioned here clearly as such. Then <laughs> a golden rule while writing discussion is include the evidence or line of reasoning supporting each interpretation. So if you are interpreting a particular result and you are saying that this is the observation we are obtaining for it, then try to support it with appropriate literature. Then if you can't support it with the literature, you have to mention whether your observation is novel or not. What is the significance of the present results? That you need to mention very clearly. Now, this particular section, when you are writing the significance of the results and discussion, should correlate with a large number of literature in the background, which has already been done. Now, interpretation or discussion, though is lengthy, you can't write too long. It can't become like literature review. Then you have to break up the discussion into paragraphs and try to get out the logic from the whole thing. So the way you write and the way you do it will highly depend upon how much results you have and you have to systematically and logically connect the results in a flow in discussion and explain them. So that will make 
it very easy as such. Now, let me remind to all the participants, as I can see, there is a question answer session at the end of the webinar. So please don't worry about the questions. We will answer you at that time you post us. Now, having said that, now conclusion. Now, conclusion is like the main and the most important part of thesis. It should tell whether whatever research hypothesis or the question you have raised, whether is it yes or is it no. Now you refer back to the problem that was asked, then you refer back to the methods that you have used and the results you have got and conclude based on them. Don't try to narrow down in conclusion the exact result. Try to broaden it. Do not repeat word for word in the abstract. So none of the things associated with abstract introduction or discussion have can be repeated in conclusion. You have to make a solid statement as whether the whole thing has worked or not. If it has worked, it is fine. If it has not worked in that case, try to mention what could be the most probable reason that it did not work. Then after you finish the conclusion, you come to recommendation. Now, recommendation section usually is optional most of the times, but some of the times it's required. And it is better if you put your recommendation section because it tells what is that you are talking of. So recommendation section of the thesis always has future plans. For example, a recommendation section says what are the limits of this thesis that we couldn't do what is that we could achieve what is that we couldn't achieve what is the remedy for what we couldn't achieve is what will be the continuation of this thesis and future directions so you include it as the future directions and here you can clearly mention some of the major uh, problems you face which are not related to your work but they are more associated with technical glitches which you can overcome and you can mention it out very clearly then post uh, recommendation you have acknowledgement now you are the most important person whom you need to acknowledge first and then because he helps you in the whole thesis and he gives intellectual input then materials and supplies whatever you have been used technical technicians lab colleagues who helped all need to be acknowledged intellectual help from any of your friends as far as from other departments others has there has to be acknowledged and financial help in the form of grants and others needs to be mentioned very clearly then then comes then having said it with that we end the contents of the thesis now we start with how to write the various contents what are the rules that have to be followed and what are the tips that will be helpful for it now first we start with how to write the abstract now uh, uh, features, a uh, classic feature of a good abstract is it explains the entire thesis in a crisp manner. So here, though I have put it as a paper, it is same for the thesis. A good abstract explains in one line the paper is important. It then goes on to give summary of your major results, preferably couched in number with error limits. So if they are any specific numbers which have to be mentioned and they form the most important observation of the thesis, you can put them, but it has to be put with statistical significance. The abstract will have sentences which explain the major implications of your work. A good abstract has these three features. It's concise, it's readable, and it's quantitative. Abstracts typically are not written more than 400 words and not more than one to two paragraphs. Abstracts as a golden rule for the paper or for thesis will not have citations. It is a very big no that you cannot use citations while writing, while writing the abstracts. Then, here are the points which you could always use when you are considering to write the abstracts. So information in title should not be repeated when you're writing the abstract. So you have to be very clear. Use numbers wherever appropriate so that it signifies your research. Here are the following set of questions which one needs to answer when you're talking of abstract. First, what did you do? What was the purpose of your research? Second, what is the question you are trying to answer? Third, what methods have you used in brief to do this? 
then what are the major results that have been obtained and what is the significant implication of the state if you have more than one significant implication you can have all but at least it should have one significant implication of the study then this is an example of an extremely good abstract which i have put forth here now if you can see here from the mid 1970s through the mid 1980s a network of young urban migrant men created an undergroup pulp fiction publishing industry in the city of dar es salaam now this is a very beautiful way of giving introduction to the thesis in the form of abstract as you can see the first sentence introduces the context of research and announces the topic under study then you are going ahead and saying as texts that they were produced in the underground economy of a city whose trajectory was increasingly outside of formalized planning and investment these novellas reveal more than their narrative content alone so you introduce the topic here then you are connecting to your topic from the existing thing and then you are talking about your topic so thus this is an example of a very beautiful abstract which has been written the remaining sentences in the abstract are interwoven answering so many of the questions which have been put forth in the earlier slide and hence this serves as a beautiful example whenever participants have time i will say that you go through this paragraph it clearly gives you an idea as how to write the abstract then having said it we come now to the question of how to write introduction now when you are writing introduction you have to have what is the goal of the paper which means why the study was undertaken or why the paper was written but when you are writing this you can't repeat the abstract this has to be written separately you have to give sufficient background information to establish the research topic then you have to give proper acknowledgement of previous work on which you are building because you are saying that there is already background information which is present here you it is essential that you need to acknowledge all that work by proper citations introduction should focus on the thesis question it is written in paragraphs as i said previously when i introduced you to this topic that first you have your paragraph where the work done is established then you connect it with what you are thinking and then you propose the hypothesis now this is not literature review and hence you don't write the entire thing you just write it briefly explain the scope of your work what will be done and what will be included very clearly now then another important point as i we as i always said is abstract uh, introduction in particular should not just introduce past present and your hypothesis but should also give a summary of the various chapters of the remaining part of the thesis now what is the difference between abstract and introduction abstract is just methods results conclusions there are two kinds of abstracts which you have one you have is structured abstract other is unstructured structured abstract is where you write the introduction methods results conclusions and the future perspective unstructured is general so it depends on the university whether you need structured abstract or unstructured whereas in introduction it's the first section of the paper it explains the research gap and proposed a hypo hypothesis it describes the importance of the study you don't explain you don't put in anything for methods results or conclusions you just give what chapters are what so one participants should clearly understand this difference between abstract and introduction when they are working it out then here are the tips for writing good introduction you give a proper acknowledgement of previous research on which you are going to build your thesis which means you cite it properly and sufficiently try to surprise the reader try to have statements which are a bit catchy and which will make the reader think as what you have done now always start with the present and connect sorry always start with the past and connect it with your present and try to get out with the best papers for literature review don't use specific vocabulary in the beginning abstract is all sorry introduction is always written in present tense for your work and past tense for all the previous upgraded work use a simple past tense present perfect tense for describing the background don't include a lot of citations but include which are necessary 
and always the voice for writing is active voice for thesis don't use passive voice which i'll be explaining to you later then having said that we come to review of literature now review of literature is broad you have to have so many things covered here so here are the major aspects associated with the review of literature first identify the topic then you identify the keywords based on which you will be uh, collecting the paper. Then these will be useful as search criteria. You collect the papers and pick up the relevant ones. Then you identify the appropriate literature from the relevant ones and you finalize the papers. So it's a stepwise process where you start with this and you go ahead. And usually review of literature is the first and the foremost thing for thesis because even before you start doing your experiments, your thesis proposal should have review of literature. So you would have collected it. So this part is not a big tension for most of the participants when their thesis is getting ready. Now, there are different kinds of literatures which are existing, which can be used for collecting what you want. Primary literature is essentially the work which has been done and the work which has been published. It includes research, research articles, it includes conference proceedings, and it includes dissertations and earlier thesis. Whereas secondary literature is a summary of primary literature which includes literary, uh, literature review articles and books. A tertiary literature is a combination of both primary and secondary literature. It will be mainly a uh, return for students and, uh, you know, for people who want to understand it in a simplified manner. Textbooks, dictionaries, encyclopedias and handbooks are the ones which compose of tertiary literature. When you want to review the literature for your topic, you have to use all the three of them and you have to cite all the three of them and there is no exception for it here. Now, what is the literature that is covered here? That is focused on four major aspects here. First, you don't collect the whole literature. You collect the background material, which is only relevant to the topic. Then various literature and research studies that are closely related to the topic of interest. Then that is the one directly related to is one. Then they are certain which are not directly related, but which implicate the study. They are also useful. So either you collect the direct literature for the source, which is of your interest, or you collect the indirect literature in many of the cases where in which you have implications of the study. Both of them could be used as a literature for thesis of your topic of interest. Now, this slide summarizes the searching strategy which exists for it. You have to search all the collection. You should use books. You should use articles. Here, as you can see, you go for books, archives, maps, exam papers, theses, journals, museums, e museum objects, ebooks. Many of them might have so many. Then you articles, which include journal articles database content and news articles so it's going to be very very broad when you do literature review for it and these searching strategies will help you how to do it because most of the participants for the today's uh, webinar are aspiring PhD students they have to write a thesis proposal at some point it will be very helpful for you that these searching and reading strategies could be useful for you now Typically, you start with, say, for your thesis proposal writing, you start with some two to three hundred papers, which include general text encyclopedias, reviews and others, historic seminal papers and all then you start filtering out to see whether they are really the ones which I need or they just have the title in the abstract then you start filtering it out so these are having a combination of specific and not less specific then you start filtering it out then you land with finally with field specific papers which will be just like only some 50 to 100 of them in that way it will be very useful this is a very beautiful Beautiful learning exercise and that's how a researcher grows when he does all this for searching and reading strategies now searching strategies that you have now first most important aspect is you have to define the topic until and unless you don't define the topic you can't do the searching strategy so what is the topic you want to uh, you know you want to search for 
what are what is the scope of, of the topic and so when you're searching what are the filters criteria that you set so that you only collect this many papers you have to draft keywords like one keyword is not sufficient for example if your area of interest is in like uh, what do you call uh, the effect of a particular drug in American population, then you don't go and search for effect of any drug. Your keyword will be the name of the drug and your keyword will be American population. That in itself will have so much that you can't do it. Then you have to again filter it out. That's what is the limitations for the search. You have to make a list of sources, databases from where information can be obtained. You determine the time frame for which you need to do this. Usually for thesis proposal writing, you will be needing at least months. So fix some two to three months and then you work out on it and then ultimately identify and you write the literature review. Now, these are the components of the literature review. Introduction to the topic, scope and organization of the topic, past and present literature and your research gap identification or purpose of the study. All the four have to be done in a systematic manner. Then only it reflects that you have understood what you are doing and how you are doing it out. Now, what are the various sources of literature that you have? Yes, you can have academic libraries, you can have public libraries, national libraries, you have commercial databases, which could be useful. All of them can be used and worked out as such. Now, other than that, you can have textbooks, articles, thesis, publications, conference papers, monographs, trade literatures. This list doesn't end. It finally depends on what you want and from where you can get it out with. Now, I will be enumerating very briefly on some of the most commonly used uh, sources of literature, which include first one is PubMed. Now, this is the most widely used search engine. PubMed is a part of National Center for Biological Information or NC. BI. Most of the articles published in any field have a unique indexed ID with PubMed. You type in your keyword and you can retrieve the desired result. The advantage of using PubMed is that you can also know whether that article is freely accessible or it needs to be purchased. If it is freely accessible, then you can directly download it. Otherwise, you have to purchase it. What is shown here is an example of it. If you give the key term, you'll get the papers. If you click on the paper, you will get the abstract and whether you can get the full text or not. Participants might be, uh, be familiar with using PubMed. Then the next one is Google Scholar. Google is too, you know, random. And when you try to type in specifically, you don't get it out. So Google Scholar was designed. It's a freely accessible web engine that indexes the text of any scholarly literature. It includes all peer reviewed journals, books, conference papers, preprints, abstracts and technical reports. You can go ahead with it quite easily and you can get out what you want because it's already connected to PubMed. Then comes Scopus. Now, Scopus is the most widely used one. It is published by Elsevier. It's an Elsevier citation and abstraction database. Free version of Scopus is available for usage. It is not just a platform for literature review. It's also a platform where you can do uh, uh, look for data analysis because it has collaborations with academia, industry, and government organizations. Scopus has wide range of journals and their articles mostly are associated with Elsevier group. Some of the journals are not associated with Scopus. That might be a disadvantage, but that doesn't matter. You can go to Crossref and you can get the remaining ones. Now, having said it, if you are have collected the literature, one of the major aspects of the collecting literature is how to manage the literature. Managing the literature includes it organizing the various references, then systematically extracting the summary of the various papers, and then you have to extract out the references in the format that is requested by university. Usually it is not done manually. You need a bibliographical manager for doing it, which three of them which are available include EndNote, Zotero and Mendeley. Mendeley is like one of the most common ones, which I'm going to discuss ahead. EndNote is similar to Mendeley. Free versions of EndNote and Zotero are available for limited time. 
important for academic institutions to purchase it at very low price. Now, once you have the references here, you can export them directly into MS Word document and you can get the format you want. This is an example of EndNote that you have. So you have in EndNote references here, which are categorized in subfolders corresponding to them. Then the keyword codes that have been used and you get the abstract when you click on the reference and the link to the PDF file automatically comes. Zotero has a similar one, as you can see here that Yes, so you have it here and then you have how if papers are retracted, if they are problems with the papers, they op automatically appear here. Then Mendeley is a reference manager which stores, organizes and searches all the references. Mendeley is connected to major publication databases and can be easily accessed. It's free of cost and it can download as many papers as possible, provided they are freely accessible. Some of the ones like from Springer cannot be freely accessed so that you have to buy them. Then. Analysis of literature. Once you have collected the literature, once you have organized and you have got it abstracted properly, you need to analyze it. You need to make notes. These are the three following points which you have to keep in mind. You summarize the key findings of each paper. You extract the critical points or arguments from each paper and examine the evidence in each published paper and see if the paper, how it suits with you and how you can use it for writing the review of literature. You understand and interpret each of the papers very carefully. Then this is the takeaway of literature review. It's important that you cite all the studies related to specific research area. You select and synthesize arguments to create a new idea. Literature review is not just writing the existing papers. You have to present the hypothesis or the research gap for which you have to do critical evaluation of all the papers. You have to have clear understanding of the topic. You need to assess the strengths and weakness of already proposed theories, which is very important. So with that, we end the literature review part. Then we shall come to research methodology. Now, research methodology is not just methods. As I said to participants earlier, research methodology includes the following parts. First, the introduction, which justifies why you are doing this research. Then the various methods utilized for, you know, what you call enumerating the data or collecting the data. Then various methods pertaining to interpretation of results and a justification of whether the hypothesis is met or not met. It will be very brief because that we discuss in detail in the results section. Then the instruments and methods for measurement. Now, this is one of the most important part. I have taken example of measurement of blood glucose levels with appropriate kits. It is a part of your thesis. You are doing it regularly in a clinical data assessment, in which case you have to mention the various instruments that you can use for it and how do you measure it. And when you are talking of various instruments that you are using and how you are measuring, you have to give the details of the method and the details of the instrument as well. Standard glucose curves have to be drawn for explaining it. So you have to even mention how you do it. However, if yours is not a simple experiment, but it's a very complex one, then you need to explain everything in detail. For example, you're working on gene network pathways, where in which multiple genes are involved in one pathway and you're assessing the role of each of the genes, then how will you study each of the genes? How will you study the end products of the genes? And how will you capture the intermediate products? If these enzymes bind metals, then they have you know, specific absorption ways by which you can study. So all the details of how you will do it have to be explained very clearly in this part. Then comes the experimental details. Now here, there you are mentioning about the methods that you will follow. Here in this section, you will be giving the details of how you did the experiment. What exactly was the method by which you have done and how you went about with it. Now you have to explain what are the positive controls and what are the negative controls needed for the experiment. Collection and processing of samples need to be done utilizing the specified instruments 
instruments and final materials needs to be handled. So what are the handling procedures that you have done? How you have operated the instrument? If in some of the cases you have to mention it in detail, only then the reader can appreciate what exactly have you done. Now, once you have given the experimental de uh, details, you have to say how you have collected the results for the experiment. Data collection is as equally important as how you write the thesis. So if you have collected the data, well, how have you collected the observations? Was it an Excel sheet if you have collected from the instrument or you have made it on your own and how you have it? The data could be either qualitative or the data could be quantitative. It doesn't matter how it is, but you have to explain how you have collected it out that becomes important then once you have collected the data and you have copies of the data then you have to analyze the data the various data obtained from different experiments first needs to be analyzed it's important to know whether that data can be considered for the writing the result or you have to again repeat the experiment so that's where is the importance of positive and negative controls which have to be used only upon confirmation of validity of each of the sets of the unknown values and once you analyze it will only then go for data analysis so it's important to understand whether that data is suitable for writing in the thesis or it needs to be reproduced successfully only then you can write it if the controls are not correct, then the data has to be eliminated and you have to write in proper data again and you have to make data again before you write for the thesis. Now here that's important. Now what exactly is a false positive? It is an error in the test which shows that the result is correct though not correct. False negative is other way around. That actually there's a result but it shows that there is no result. For example, when pregnancy tests are done in the kids, so you can have false positive and false negative. False positive meaning outcome is that the girl is pregnant though she is not. And in false negative, she's actually pregnant, but it shows it is not. So either of the ways. Now, this is beautifully described by a term called FDR or false discovery rate. Now, the false discovery rate is the most important aspect which has to be considered. So the various false positives and false negative in the experiments need to be evaluated. They have to be taken out and eliminated. Then the ones which are meeting the criteria of correctness only have to be considered. After eliminating the errors, the final data needs to be obtained and utilized for work. If the data is falling short of writing for the thesis, repeat the whole data and wait for writing the thesis because without having a proper data, you cannot write a thesis at all. Then once you have got, okay, now you have uh, removed all the error data and you have put in the proper data with FDR constraints and all, you have to model the data. Modeling the data is the next part once you have data organized. It can be done in Excel sheets that basic statistical tests and others can be done in Excel sheets. However, you can draw standard curves, regression analysis, slopes and inputs. Steps. Students t-test standard deviations and averages across samples which are classically utilized can be performed in Excel sheets. So you can do all of these and you can put all of them. But however, it sometimes Excel alone is not sufficient to do it out. You will be needing more than Excel to do it. And here are the softwares which you could use. Graphpad Prism, R, SPSS, SAS, MATLAB, any of them you could use. But the issue here is SPSS, MATLAB and others are epidemiological softwares or softwares where which you have huge amounts of data which needs to be processed. Graphpad Prism is the best one for students, but it is not freely accessible. And Graphpad Prism, in if you have animal experiments or you have certain groups to be analyzed, it will help you to do all the tests comparing the groups. It will give you the regression curves properly as such. So you can use all uh, any of these for working it out. Then ethical considerations, if in case you have done clinical data where in which patient's consent was taken, those have to be put in the methods section clearly. Has the informed consent 
been confirmed the participants so the the pre-filled forms with participants signatures has to be submitted along with the thesis the confidentiality of information written consent from the staff that this information has not been leaked out and the various observations data correlations and overall conclusions have to be kept highly confidential so the various confidentiality forms and the consent forms have to be kept with the participant and have to be deposited when requested so that the thesis can be processed because at times this becomes plagiarized the thesis if such forms are not provided and the thesis can be disqualified without any further consideration by university itself it doesn't have to go to reviewers as well then then that summarizes as how to write the results and how to you know analyze it we come sorry how to write the methods and analyze it we come to how to write results now this is the most critical part of the thesis which you have to understand once you have finished collecting the data you have analyzed the data you can start writing the results the results have to be reported concisely and in a logical order you make paragraphs with brief text and each text is supported by a definitive figure or a table so it has to go in the flow first though you might have collected results in a different order there should be a logical flow so you can you know change the results tables and graphs and put them to get a appropriate flow you have to use tables and graphs to illustrate specific findings the results should be written always in past tense they are never written in present tense there is no specific length for the results chapter because this is the core you can write how much ever you want but the issue which happens with it is it can't be like literature review. It has to be concise as much as it is required to be. Then the next part of it is the results section should include the findings of your study. And let me tell you, they should be the major observations. Sometimes you have observations which are minor and which might not contribute much. You don't include them. Even sometimes you have observations which are minor but are important. Such can be included. Now, the results section will include data presented in tables, charts, graphs and other figures. A contextual analysis of this data explaining its meaning in sentence form report on data collection recruitment and or participants data that corresponds to central research question that's what you the question that you have asked in the introduction and secondary findings secondary findings are not usually given uh, that much importance unless they contribute significantly to the main one now, here is the point. Results always should answer your research gap or hypothesis. It should answer your main hypothesis or research question. The order of presenting the results is arbitrary. You don't have to worry about it. You can always present it the way you want it. Results that are sidelights should not receive equal weight. That's what I said earlier. When presenting the results, uh, the results for the main hypothesis, consider the following points. A are the results clear concise and simple they there is, should be clarity and it should be simply present are there enough details presented in the results and explained properly in the text there should be no bias while explaining the results they should not be sloppy it should be crystal clear and properly done are there any adverse results which are seen if they are seen you have to report thesis and these adverse effects whatever have been observed what do they mean how do they mean also need to be explained now while writing the results this is an important example which i have taken for consideration if you have statistical significance for the results you can attach the p-value while writing in the text as well as in the caption for example there was a significance difference Beans and Franks group and the corn dog group. Instead of saying that, cardiac output was less in the beans and Franks group with p-value of 0 0.03, which makes it significant. This statement packs more impact than the later statement. So it's important that you consider it out. 
writing like that don't comment on the results at any given time don't attach equal importance to the, the whole statistical aspect so you have a lot of statistical data so don't put write the whole statistics put in the key findings of the statistics and whatever they are only include them out don't write anything than that so if you want to put in the p value if you want to talk about r square you can put those and say the significance but not beyond that and having said it that is how you have to write the results and that is how you focus on presenting your results then you come to how to write a discussion now when you are writing the discussion you don't repeat your results, which is a golden thing. Many of the times participants get confused between results and discussion. So discussion should not repeat the results. Now, discussion is usually returned in the form of paragraphs. First, you initially introduce the research topic briefly, and then you go ahead to summarize it. Explain how the results answer your research question or research gap. That is the most important thing. The result, the research question, whether it's answered or not. Emphasize what are the new observations that you got out from the results and from the study. Give alternative explanations if possible for the new observations as why you might have found them and what it means. Now, when you are writing the discussion, limit speculation. Don't speculate anything in the discussion. Discussion is based on the results and not on speculation. Avoid using biased language or you don't try to bias the previous work. Discussion will have citations from the literature because you are trying to support your work with literature work. Don't confuse non-significant values with no difference. What I mean to say is if the p-value is large, if the p-value is like greater than 0 0.01, then that result is non-significant. So you use the word non-significant, don't use the word no difference because sometimes your results may be based on small population sizes and not on big ones. When you do the same thing in larger population samples, you might find it has significance. Don't confuse statistical significance with clinical importance and never give any incidental observations or smaller observations equal weightage as your main observation that might damage your whole uh, interpretation. discussion. Now, these are the components of the discussion section which have to be considered very clearly and have to be used. First A, first and most important aspect, are we meeting the hypothesis? If whether is the hypothesis null or not, meaning are your expectations as expressed in hypothesis? If it is meeting with your hypothesis, it is well and good. But if it is not meeting your hypothesis, then you are in trouble. What you read before the beginning, is it matching with that or not? Are the theoretical considerations being worked out? If your uh, results agree with previous work, it's fine. If they do not, explain why not. Because many a times your study might not match with what exactly is going on there and how exactly is going on there. In that case, you mention as we cannot account for the differences seen. If there are any limitations for the research, like sample size or others, mention it clearly and say why they are limitations. If there are discrepancies associated with the results, then you have to justify why you have discrepancies associated with the results from what is already published in the literature. All these are the various points that have to be enumerated and that have to be returned very clearly when you are talking about then we come to how to write conclusion. Now, when you are writing conclusion, this is the last part. The conclusion should pack a punch. It should tell clearly what exactly has been done. Did it meet your observations or not? And what is it all about? It should clearly state the answer to the main research question. It should summarize and reflect on the research. It should make recommendations future work on the topic and tell what is the new idea or knowledge you have got out of this research it should be concise and engaging now leave aim to leave the reader with a clear understanding of the main discovery what is the significant implication of the research tell it clearly to the uh, reader and let him imagine what next can be done and how it can be done as such 
Now, there is a distinct difference between discussion and conclusion, which participants might not be aware of. That's why I put it here. Now, the discussion will have interpretation of your results. It compares your results with from the literature. It discusses the limitations of your results and tells you if there are any unexpected results, what it means and mentions what is the value that you have added to the uh, study, existing study and how it made it prominent. But when you come to conclusion, conclusion restates your hypothesis again. It tries to tell the significance of your study, highlights the limitations, highlights the overall significance and future directions which are present. So there is a bit of overlap, but not too much because conclusion should pack the punch. Discussion on other hand should compare with literature and tell what exactly is going on here. Then. Then comes how to write the references. Now, the way you write the references will be provided by the university guidelines as how to do it. References either can be in text, meaning they can be put in parenthesis, parenthesis, parenthesis at the bottom of page as footnotes or as end notes in the end of the chapter. References when written in brackets should be short with the author's name and year. When you are writing in the footnote, you can put it in a proper manner like as how it's provided here. No matter whatever is the style of reference you use, APA, Chicago, Harvard or whatever it is, it has to follow the uniform thing. All the entire thesis has to be referenced in the same format. That is the reason why <clears throat> it is suggested you use a bibliographical software and this is the software that you use for references. So it will help you to put it in a uniform format and so that such that there are no manual errors when you write the thesis. Now with that, we finish one bulk part of how to write the thesis. Here we focus now on writing tips for the thesis as how you write and the way you do it. Writing tips, first one, which I have mentioned here is vagueness. When you are writing the thesis, don't be vague. Okay, for example, terms such as numerous, a number of huge, a few, some of, uh, some large, very large and others, they don't make any sense. Don't try to be so vague. If you are giving the numbers, you give the numbers clearly. In sometimes we use phrases such as the wider community, but that has no meaning. What exactly you want to say? Now, women with type 2 diabetes who live on the outskirts of Darwin or children from a single parent family who live in New England or expatriates from Australia have no meaning. Please specify the region and specify what you are talking of. That will make it much, much clear and understandable. Then other examples like globally, many American people and many countries of the world has no meaning. You specify the country and you give the name, then it has meaning. Candidates often fall into the trap of writing a wide body of literature and not citing the authors properly. Now, if you have like multiple authors or more than one author using it, then you can say blo uh, blogs and jakes claimed or contributed saying that will suffice. Just don't use one author's name because it is too vague in that way. Now, the second one when you are doing is trying to be accurate. Being accurate is very important when you are writing thesis. For example, the number of participants was 25. That, that doesn't make complete sense because is that you mean to say that the total number of participants are 25 or are you considering 25 participants? If you say total number of participants were 25, then it is done with. When you are giving percentages in a table, like if you are presenting that total is 100% and you have subsets like a particular population had this much effect, this much percentage and another group had this much. When you are presenting subsets of percentage in thesis, they should completely account for 100%. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Yes. Yeah, so you don't usually start statements with about 14.3% is exact because you are trying to approximate here. Rather say 14.3% is fine. Now, when you are using years, you have to use apostrophes. 1960 apostrophe S or 2010 apostrophe S is far more better and being accurate there. 
Now, always quantify the percentages, numbers, and increase or decrease in the values and quantities, which is very important. Then table 13 or figure 22 makes apt. You don't mention like table above or figure below page 25. Always remember the page numbering once the final thesis editing is done will be different from what you start when you start with the page numbering. So don't refer to anything on a page. It will be not useful. Just refer to the table or the figure and say it is this. For example, if discussion of yellow submarines is in chapter 4 is far better than saying discussion of yellow submarines is in so and so page number because that might sometimes not match and be accurate. So you just put in the correct referencing orders when you do it. Then what exactly are irrelevant statements? When we say irrelevant statements, they have no use. Like you don't use the words and thesis like because of constraints of time, space, resources. It has no meaning. And if they are more associated with interviews and qualitative, there is no meaning as how much time the interview it took to come and how much time it took for you to interview him and uh, who provided the snacks and other items and how long transcription took they all are irrelevant what is relevant there is whether the interview is done or not and how it has been done that will make it much much better and useful as such then we come to grammar now, grammar looks very simple, but in most of the cases, people get flattered off here. So it's important to know how to do it. First one is with hyphens. Now, don't follow MS Word when you're writing all the time because it is not scientific. It's only English there. In some of the cases, such as decision making, rubbish collecting, information gathering, you have to use hyphens because they are adjectives. And in some cases where you have an adverb, you don't need a hyphen, like happily integrated classrooms. You don't put a hyphen there because it's an adverb more which is used there. Then the voice used for writing thesis is always active voice. The one beautiful example is a statement I put forth there. The full implications, however, were felt by the congregation in Jan when that's passive voice. However, the congregation felt the full implications in January, which makes far more better tense and far more applicable. Acronyms, if you are using, should be provided the first time uh, like Australian Broadcasting Commission, you have to put it even in the keywords and mention it out. And then you use ABC everywhere as how you are going on. So somewhere you have to give full form of the acronym and then only you can proceed ahead with it. Then there is what is called as hedging. The word hedging is particularly used when you use uh, put a phrase in a quote where it is not required. Many a times uh, um, native learners who start using it, they don't know how to do it. So they go with it. So hedging, for example. So for example, if you want to talk of hedging now based on competitive selection process oriented to merit and performance criteria, why exactly merit is put in quote where it is not required? What exactly do you mean? That is what is one point which is not required. So you don't put that's called hedging. You don't do that where it is not required. And here the word paradigm shift from the old public. It doesn't have to be. It's a general term. So you don't need to worry about it. Where language is a part of everyday lexicon, hedging is unnecessary unless you are introducing a specific term. So this needs to be remembered and, uh, you know, utilized effectively as such. With that, we come next to formatting the thesis. Formatting has to be done specifically. You remove excess spaces between the words. You use a standardized spacing at the end of sentence and beginning of the next paragraph. Heading styles have to be formatted. Where required, you introduce a page break. Don't introduce a section break. Margins and layouts can be altered within the section break. And when you are writing section 6, you don't use 6.0 because there is no 6.0. It's only 6. Except from simple paragraphs, figures or diagrams, if you are inserting PDFs into a Word document, they will not be having good clarity. So you, it is essential that if a PDF is being used in the Word, you have proper resolution and you follow it out. Then these are the golden rules followed by any university for formatting the thesis. Font size usually is Times New Roman 12. 
header has a chapter number, footer has a chapter number, maximum number of pages for thesis is 175 to 200. If you are using illustrations from other journal articles, you need to have permission to prevent plagiarism. Otherwise, it will be happily plagiarized and your thesis will be disregarded. Margins, when you put in 2.5 centimeters, that's one inch on top and bottom, 3.5 on left and 1.3 on right. Line distance is 1.5 with justification tab on. The various instructions mentioned are for the chapters of thesis along with summary conclusion and references. For abstract and other pages, the font size and line distance remain the same. Title page, these rules are not applicable for the title page because it will be written in a different way and in a different point font. Page numbers prior to chapters will be in Roman numerals, whereas for chapters it is from 1, 2, 3 onwards. And please adhere to the university guidelines for formatting the thesis and use them only for writing. You don't go ahead and do anything else because your thesis will not be considered by university itself. Now these are the steps in writing the thesis. Understand the goal of the thesis clearly. Know the qualities of a good thesis. Understand the structure of a good thesis, the language and seek help where required. The do not send thesis writing, never plagiarize the thesis, never cook up data and use it for writing. Don't use passive voice. Don't use this word like quite some considerable, a great deal. And don't use abbreviations which have not been defined earlier. You don't try to present an already existing fact as a your fact, which will be problematic as such. Now, what are the features of a good thesis? When we come to that, a well-written thesis will have the following points. One, a clear title and abstract, which define and give idea clearly of what you are doing and how you are doing. A structure and format, which helps the reader to absorb the subject matter an intellectual coherence, which starts with precise aims from which you follow the research design and clear conclusion, accuracy in grammar and punctuation, consistency in referencing. These are the aspects which we, are, we will be looking at when we say we are looking for a good thesis. Now, the recommendations when you come for the thesis will have the limitations of the current research, the scope for further research and the various questions that arise from existing study that needs to be pointed out very clearly. So having said that, we come to the next point. OK, you have returned your thesis. You have made, uh, you know, the necessary corrections which you feel are ideal and optimal. Then what is that which you need to do exactly now you have to edit the thesis editing the thesis is the most important part which is left behind after the entire thing is done editing involves three major steps one is proofreading editing for grammar and spelling and plagiarism checking now they you don't personally do it yourself they are softwares which will help you to do it so proofreading once the entire thesis is written, it needs to be read completely for consistency and obvious errors, which means you are looking for scientific inconsistencies. The various statements needs to be analyzed thoroughly. Once you finish writing and compiling it, you give copies to your supervisor, other lab members, and even to your fellow researchers in different departments. Let them go through and tell what it is and how it is. Then, they, once that is done and you have got the proofreading done, then we do the editing. Editing is best done using Grammarly's website. It removes spell, it will help you with spell check, grammar check and errors while typing. Grammarly is one of the online available software that could be utilized. It is free of cost. Only thing is you have to log in with your email ID and it will help you completely. So there are no issues with it. Then plagiarism is the act of copying someone else's work or idea and passing it off as your own. In precise words, it's an act of fraud. It involves stealing someone else's artwork. So any thesis has to be checked for plagiarism. Universities have their own plagiarism softwares, which you can use for this purpose and get it done. Usually anything less than 5% is considered to be safe and not plagiarized as such. So plagiarism, there are a large number of softwares which you could use, which include Grammarly, Qtext, DupliChecker, Plaque,
scan, unit check, and authenticate, or any of these could be utilized for you know checking the plagiarism aspects, and you could use them for it as such. Now, once you are done, even with the plagiarism, and you have made the final draft of your thesis, then comes the point. You go ahead and you submit your thesis. The abstract, the university will go through the basic aspects. And once the, the university finds it's fine, then you go ahead. The abstract is floated by university to the reviewers who recommend, whom you recommend. And then it goes to the reviewers. So what exactly reviewers look for when they uh, want to analyze a thesis? First, A, is uh, it will be mainly based on the research gap. If you have identified the research gap based on the literature review, the question is, has the literature been reviewed properly? Is the research question relevant based on the literature review? Then they come and check the, are the methods that have been followed are correct or not. If they have obtained the results, are there any errors in the results? You have to justify. Does the results support the research question identified? Yes or no? Does the discussion and conclusion along with the summary justify the result? That is another part they look at. Finally, does this research have any future scope and implications? Based on all these, you go ahead further and then the reviewers send back their comments. Once reviewers send back their comments, you go through the comments and you modify them. And once it is modified, you go for your defense. And once you go for your defense, then you defend your thesis and successfully get it done. So essentially, for today's part of what is called as uh, you know thesis writing, we have tried to cover systematically the various contents which are present and the various aspects which have to be covered. I tried to cover how to write each of them and how to work out with each of it. So I hope that the participants will now go through these slides carefully and try to evaluate and understand the various aspects because thesis writing is the terminal stage of one's career in which you have finished the entire thing and so you are submitting your thesis. So it should reflect your work and it should also reflect the credibility of your work. So a properly written thesis can give you a lot of rewards and also can give you a large number of papers essentially. So having said that, I uh, yes, so here um, we have the writing and editing services for you. If in case you are finding issues for writing or for your editing work, we at Research Graduate can help you to do this. Here is our contact details and these are the various ones we do. Topic selection, proposal writing, review paper, research paper, thesis, master's dissertation, statistical analysis, editing, proofreading and formatting. So any of them, we, we do it for you. And so there is no problem. Having said that, it ends the webinar here. I'm here for your live question answer sessions. Please post your questions in the chat box and I will be happy to answer it. So let me scroll down and see what are the various questions and then I will answer it back for you. Yes, Surinder Kumar Bhutani book says, how many literature to be reviewed? Now, Surinder, there is no such specification as how many have to be reviewed. You can do as many as you want. Usually the number of references is not limited for a thesis, unlike paper. So you can add as many as you can. But the issue here is typically don't go for more than two to 300 because if too many references you add, it becomes too much to read also. And then reviewers might have questions as why irrelevant references have been put in. Uh, Joseph asks, uh, okay, uh, see you spas. Will we get the presentation in our email after the session? Yes, you will get it. And so there is no problem with it. Now, Amina says, what to do for non-significant research? Amina, don't worry so much about if it is non-significant also. It doesn't mean there is no difference. You just go ahead and publish it, whatever is there, or you publish it as a thesis. It might not go for a paper, but you'll definitely get a thesis done out of it. Dr. Muhammad Rustam says, please conduct a session on details. 
please conduct a session on detailed research methods sure i think tejasvi will see to it if we can do it please post a message to her also and we will consider it out um uh Daniel says please can help me with simple way of writing the contribution to the research yes daniel uh, means you can write a query to us we can help you otherwise also you have have the results already with you you have the interpretation of the result that itself should tell you what is the contribution of your work to the research if you are still having issues send us the things and we can help you in writing it out kavita tripathi says how much paper should be included in a thesis there is no such to all the participants let me raise this question again there is nothing like how much you can have as many number of papers as you want but don't uh, keep adding too many papers because they have it then the reviewers might raise objections so please ensure that you have limited i would say maximum 2 to 300 references that could be a good one and ideal one 300 is on the higher end sunil gadgi says what is the difference between references and bibliography uh we have this done earlier even in a plagiarism webinar which was done two weeks back sunil if you can get that ppt it will be great you can understand it in brief let me tell you bibliography is not just references along with it it is also the description of the source and how we took from the reference whereas references are just pure references as such uh Polomi says, "In which part we do hypothesis testing? Hypothesis testing is done in the experiments and in the results test. So your results should have whether your hypothesis is valid or invalid, and that is what you present even in your discussion also." Uh, Preeti says, "Is there any possibility to help for writing research paper under mathematical model? As I dropped the inquiry to the executive, but no response." now uh, meaning i think they just we can answer this question better but there is a possibility you can always have possibility but please revert back to tejasvi once again and she will help you out properly about this uma says dr shrinivas you speak and voice is so clear and every confusion is very clear at the topics your explanation is really too good thank you thanks for the compliment uma if you have any questions please do post it and uh, we will help you out now polomi says how much elaboration of research gap is written in introduction now introduction will not have too much of research gap it will be like one or two statements only polomi not more than that then uh, polomi says what are keywords do we count articles and prepositions in word limit uh, not exactly keywords are the words which you have used for describing and which are constantly reoccurring so articles and prepositions i'm not sure if it is but when you put it for the word format however it considers for counting the words you can take it as such then mamta verma has a question in final submission how many research papers and uh, how many research papers and conferences are required as per ugc now well i'm not sure of how many as per ugc you, you can go to their website and check it but i don't think there's a limit for the research papers but for conference as well because it's a thesis so please check at the ugc website once otherwise even i have to check it as i'm not sure of it hmm Amina says are your editing friend, uh, services available in french i'm not sure of it amina because we have to look for french writers but then tejasvi can answer that question better for you please post it to her and she'll tell you kuljit singh says excellent webinar on special laser kindly differentiate between dissertation and thesis a dissertation is a small project which you do for masters and you finish it off a thesis is for phd so definitively dissertation is like a, a bridge version of thesis thesis will have much more than that mm. kuma uh, 
Vivek Kumar says how to write statement of the problem. Statement of the problem, Vivek, usually is concise and precise. If you have got the literature and you know what is the problem, then you frame it. Otherwise, you send it to us. We will help you in writing it for you. Uh, Jitender Kumar says, does the thesis usually consist of research papers which you have returned to fulfill your PhD requirement? Yes, they do consist of, but you don't just paste the paper exactly like that. You have to modify it so that it fits exactly. Nassim says, what is positive and negative control in experiment? A positive control is a control which shows that your experimental setup or protocol works. A negative control is the one which shows that you don't have any background in your whole method. It's not coming from non-specific aspects. Neeraj Kumar says, sir, can we use probability and non-probability sampling in our research? Depends on the research, Neeraj. If it is required, you can use it and there is no problem. Abhinay Jaiswal says, representation of data in tabular is better or in graph? In both the ways, it is better, Abhinay. You can do both the ways and see whichever is the best one. B. Ravi Kumar says, how can we get the research papers? As I have said, PubMed, Scopus, Google Scholar, Cross Reference, any of them you can use and you can get it. So you just have to start trying it out and you will understand it. Nigamananda says, normally how many chapters are required for a PhD thesis? Uh, Nigamananda, usually it is like this. You will have an introduction chapter, you will have materials and methods, literature review, then re uh, results, discussion, conclusion. That is around six to seven chapters. These are the basic. But if you have more results and more aspects, then you can make them as more chapters also. Now, um, Dhanashri says, how many pages of thesis? I have already mentioned upper end is 200. And you can go to maximum of 175 to 200. Even if it is less, it's okay. But 100 is like the minimum which you see. Anushri says, how to finalize the topic for research? Anushri, if you want to finalize the topic for research, you first have to get what you want and then you can do it. Otherwise, you send it to us, we can help you out. Uh, Nosilchi says, what is the best way for looking at gaps in a topic while doing a literature review? Now, as I said, during the, what do you call, a review of literature, highlight the points, put the entire things understand, make the abstracts, highlight the points, and from the points, whatever you have highlighted, you will automatically get out the gaps. Pranjali says, I have started my PhD recently. Please, could you suggest how to start data collection, which should be useful in my future? For if you want to collect the data, do the literature review. If you want uh, to know whatever is already existing, but if you want to, if you are doing your experiments and you want to collect the data that I have already mentioned, make Excel sheets, enter the entire thing, try to identify the patterns based on what you have collected, but use appropriate controls to know if whatever you are collecting is logical or not also. Then Avin Shekhar Chaurasya says, where to mention data analysis? Is it a part of methodology or results? Data analysis, the software used will be a part of methodology. Core data analysis is a part of results. Mm. Suparna says, what are the best methodologies of historical research? Well, what is that you want to do? You go ahead, you collect the papers, you collect the, identify the research gap. Ziba says, how to put limit to number of hypotheses? You don't, but your thesis, if you, are, if you are doing thesis, you do need to have a limit. You can't have 10, 15 hypotheses in working on the thesis. Frame two or three hypotheses and see which it answers out. Mm, Anushri says, I'm confused in finalizing the topic for research. In that case, you take our help, Anushri. Please post it to us and we can help you. Ziba says, how to put limit to number of hypotheses? I've already answered this, so it's fine. Sulochana says, how many of the literature papers have to be attached in paper published and thesis? While publishing a paper, your literature has to be limited, not exceeding 20 to 30. For a thesis, you can go up to 100 and there is no problem. Now, 
Uma Banerjee says, how many pages of thesis? Maximum 200. Because writing a 200 page thesis is so difficult to all the participants. If you think writing so many pages makes so much sense, understand that writing a 200 page thesis will take such a long time and you'll be eventually burnt out and tired. Kalyan Ram says, is there any software drawing tool for drawing block diagrams, flowcharts and others in thesis and journal articles? I think PowerPoint and uh, Excel, uh, PowerPoint has those. If you are still not happy with them, you have to look for specific ones. Even I'm not sure of it. Rajesh Ganpat Virle says, for doing questionnaire survey, how many minimum respondents are required? The more, the better. If the sample size is small, uh, the issue which happens with it is your observations will not be good. As you increase the sample size, it will be much better. Vivek Kumar says, uh, how to write statement of the problem? If you are not able to understand how to write it, we can help you out. Please do approach us. We are here to do that. Now, B. Ravi Kumar says, where do we get PhD thesis in our related area? Now, what is your area? I have no idea of. But yes, you can get it. It depends on your area because you have not mentioned anything. I can't do more than this for you at least. Be, post, be specific in your area and we can tell you. Okay, Ravi Kumar says, why identification of problem is the first step, not selection of the problem in research process? Now, both are interrelated. First, you have to identify what the problem is. Then only you can select accurately because the problem might have been worked out by so many people. So if you identify, then in that case, uh, what happens is if you have identified in that specific case, once after identification is done, then you can know what exactly is going on and how to answer it. So if you don't identify the problem, you can never come to the core to understand what it is. Neeraj Kumar says, can we, uh, that I have already answered. Sunil Dankar says, how to draw high, high quality figures? Uh, you can use GraphPad Prism. You can use Adobe Photoshop. But if higher quality doesn't mean very high resolution. Trying to go for higher resolutions and compressing them, you lose the resolution ability. So please try to ensure that you use any of them at 300 DPI. And then you will understand what it is. Uh, Disha says, please conduct sessions on research paper writing. Disha, we have our previous sessions on them. You can go through them and see if in case you want any specific things as such. Mohammad Akram says, where do we have to include theoretical framework or conceptual framework? Now, the conceptual framework is included in the research methodology section. Now, Vinod Kumar, you, how to write references as in format and cited in literature review? Yes, Vinod Kumar, you have to use a bibliography manager there to do it out. Nitya says, best tool for, uh, for experimental research. I don't know, Nitya, exactly if you have any such best tool. It depends on what research it is, and so you could probably do it out. Now, Vivek says, is it okay to help outside consultant? Is it ethical from perspective? I don't think it should be a problem because even if you take help from a consultant, the consultant's, consultant's name will not come in your thesis because as per our agreements, we just provide you the service, but we don't claim any part of it. You can check the confidentiality agreements with Tejasvi and then she can help you and then you can decide based on it. Nanda Kishore Shah says, if copy from published article and rewrite it, then it comes under plagiarism. Yes, Nanda Kishore, unless you have modified it sufficiently that it is not plagiarized. Kamlesh Suman says, any webinar in research paper preparation? We actually have done on research paper uh, publication and research paper writing previously. You go through it, we will discuss it and with Tejas we and appropriately see if we have to conduct any of them in the near future also, we will let you know. Mazhar says regarding grants and funds for PhD. Now that you have to see how you do it out. Usually you can't because grants and funds are applied by uh, supervisors as they have a PhD, but you can look for it. Now, for all the participants, if you want webinars on research paper preparation, publication, or any of them, 
you will get our previous webinars on the research graduate because since you are already enrolled however if you want them to be repeated or on any of them have to be presented in a different format please contact tejasvi and she can help you out with it now sagender singh parmar says are hypothesis mandatory in research yes because that tells you what exactly are you trying to do now amina says looking for journals or international trade uh, amina you have to look specifically using these terms because even i am don't have idea about it Kindly says, "Thank you so much for the presentation. Can we cite in conclusion and recommendation? No, it's a strict no. You can't. We'll be grateful if you can share with us a very good sample of a paper or dissertation related to wildlife ecology. Ah, uh, well, please ask this to Tejas. We she can help you out more with this." Mazhar says, "I am writing paper. You said to begin with the methods first and introduction later. Can you please elaborate? Because if you put literature review in introduction, and if the same thing you use for methods and others, then it will be the same. So you write all others, then you come to introduction. You know what it is and how it is." Uh, um, Pranjali says. please can you clear me do i need to add all my data collection saved excel need to showcase in thesis yes but make it logical to showcase sulochana so, says is there any training service for us to learn optical and structural characterization that is too specific sulochana so, i don't think so but you can ask uh, uh, tejasvi she will assist you with that pavitra says very useful is life cycle assessment a scientific research method it could be but you need to elaborate because i couldn't get your question exactly jatindranath jain says motivation part is included in introduction or where uh motivation part you can include it in introduction partly and then you can put it in the literature review as such um Ashwini Patil says, "Convey us future webinars. Waiting for guidance of paper writing for Scopus. I think very specifically as such for Scopus that we have to discuss with Tejas if we can do that. Otherwise, we will come up with paper writing related aspects as such." Dipali says we are supposed to publish two papers how to combine two published papers to write a thesis it's very easy dipali if you already have published the papers each paper can go as a chapter introduction from each of them you can use for making one introduction methods you already have so you will have two chapters already with introduction and the results sections and others being done now nigusi asres dori says in which part or body of thesis that a researcher can best write his knowledge of the issue that will come in review of literature and a part in introduction nasina says methodology used approached in previous researches can be adopted from indian specific conditions it could be as long as it's acceptable but that you have to check with your supervisor uh anil k verma says is geographical limitation necessary in research in subject like education it could be depends on the constraint of the work so you please think about it as what it is and so you will know automatically then uh, nibhin bansal says will there be a session on research paper also well we will work out and if there is any such thing we will let you know somendra says is it must to use spss for data analysis can can we use advanced excel instead well if it works you can use it but if it doesn't then you have to go with it then uh, um ilamati says how many pages we have to write that's max of 200 then um, ks ilango says 35 human samples okay for thesis because getting concern is difficult well that you can mention as a limitation and you can proceed ahead and write thesis with that much only sagender singh parma uh, this i have already answered the question mm Polomi says, please conduct sessions on sampling and hypothesis testing. Yeah, we will consider it, Polomi. Then uh, Subhash Pingel says, difference between title and problem statement. 
a title is what is the concise summary a problem statement is a summary of the past with your present so they do differ if you have confusion you can approach us and we will help you jasmine says how and where i can add pilot study in thesis like pilot study in field of psychological intervention that you can add it with the conceptual framework in research methodology mm -hmm. Ravi Kumar says, I want to watch previous webinars of yours. You are enrolled, so you have already them in there. You can access them easily and get it going. Anil K. Verma says, how many research papers should be published in journals to complete PhD? I think two as of more, for most of the universities, but check with where you want to uh, uh, get your thesis done with which university. Nitya says, difference between research design and design of study. Research design is how you are going to do the overall thing. Whereas design of study will include how the study will be conducted. So research design will be mostly going with methods and other parts. Design of the whole study will cover all of them as such. Sonam says, how to write an abstract for journal? Is it same for thesis abstract? Yes, it's almost similar. Maybe slight differences. Uh, for thesis, it's unstructured. For journals, they are structured with each of the headings, introduction, methods, implications, and others. Mm, Smita says, how to edit references in Zotero and Mendeley? Can you please organize a webinar? Uh, well, we will consider it. Thanks for suggesting this, but we have to see how we could do out with it. Then Pabitra says, I'm working on environmental issues and economic uh, impact of EV through life cycle assessment. Do you provide me assessment? Assess yeah, we may be, but you just talk to Tejasvi about it. So having uh, said that, uh, we end with the question answer sessions. Here are the points to be noted. The participation certificate will be emailed to you before 4.30. You will get the recording of this webinar and PPT between 2.45 to 3.45 today. Please check your emails for the upcoming webinar so that you don't miss any of them. Then, uh, if we have missed any of the questions corresponding to yours, please do let us know by email. We'll answer it back. Thanks for attending the webinar. And we have the references which we have used attached here. Once, of all, uh, once again, a huge thanks for all the participants for attending this webinar. See you back at the next webinar. If there are any further questions, don't worry. Drop the queries to us and we will reply back to you. So having said that, I hope that all of you have enjoyed today's webinar on thesis writing. If you have any suggestions for any of the topics related to, please post to us and we'll see how to make webinars accordingly. You can contact us at the WhatsApp number, which is coming up in the message, or you can email us at info at researchgraduate.com and we will be there to help you out anytime.